And welcome once again to Strange Planet. On this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into the Antichrist system, how it operates, where it operates, where it's all heading. We'll discuss Hollywood mind control, satanic ritual abuse, witchcraft, and programmed multiples in, in the entertainment business. David Brent Hevener is an American singer, songwriter, director, actor, composer, producer, and writer. And uh, his brand new one is End Times Investigations. David, welcome to the program. How are you? <laughs> Thanks, Richard. You know, with that great introduction of me doing so many things, I think I'm a program multiple. Uh, <laughs> you must be. You must be. I think, I, I think I've got multiple personalities there. Um, it's great to be with you and in, in, in your, uh, in your audience. Uh, thank you for having me on. Let's start off with the definition. What do you mean by antichrist system? Well, <clears throat> um, and, and Jesus talked about this in the Bible. Uh, in these last days, which... Um, uh, which we believe that we're in, um, there is uh, a, two systems in play. There's, there's the Christ system, the God system, and then there's the anti-God system. The anti-Christ system is headed by uh, Lucifer, uh, the devil, Satan, what have you. Now, the anti-Christ system today, I believe, operates uh, within um, the government, within the financial system, within the entertainment system. I call it the satanic pyramid. It operates within the culture. So, so this system uh, has various legs, uh, if you will, uh, to it to get across its agenda. Now you started off in, in, the mental, health, uh, in mental health, right? As a mental health professional. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, that's in my book. Um, and I, I don't talk about it a lot, but I'm happy to talk about it right now. Um, I, I was raised uh, in, in a very strange atmosphere. I saw angels. I saw demons. When I was a little boy, five, six, seven, eight years old, I, apparitions, I, I was actually saved by uh, a, a couple of angels in a, in a car wreck from being um, obliterated by a semi. Uh, I saw demons uh, in my closet. And so this caused me to seek out... Um, the supernatural, because as a little boy, you don't understand what all this is. And so when I hit um, 16, 17, 18, 19, I was very interested in psychology and the way the human mind operates to find out, well, is this uh, real? Is it spiritual? Or is it our imagination? Or is it a chemical imbalance? What is it? So that got me into uh, psychology. Psychology got me into uh, uh, into social work. And within social work, I went to work at Central State Hospital, uh, working with, in behavior modification with children on what we call the forensic ward, which is a ward where they put children that can't function within even a mental institution, uh, sometimes not even within um, a detention center. So we had kind of the, uh, the cream of the crop when it came to children that had a lot of issues. And uh, I mean, at that point, did you, were you able to draw any conclusions? I mean, for example, what, what percentage of, well, that's a, that's a very speculative question, but is there um, sort of a non-prosaic or maybe a supernatural explanation for some of these mental health issues that the young people, that you were witnessing with young people? Yeah, I have to tell you, it was mostly spiritual. When I say spiritual, I don't want anybody to go thinking that I'm running off to a church. I'm talking spiritual. I'm talking the supernatural. I'm talking it wasn't natural, okay? Um, I actually had one uh, gal that I talk about in my book. She was uh, 14 years old, a Billy Joe, and uh, she... Um, she had a lot of issues. She was uh, uh, molested uh, by her stepbrothers. Uh, probably went deeper than that, but I couldn't get any more information than that. But one night I got a call. It was about two o'clock in the morning uh, to come down to uh, the unit that they had a problem with uh, it was with Bobby. And uh, seriously, I mean, I'm telling you the truth. I walked, they had cleaned the, the, the ward out because in the room they had about 
six or seven other kids sleeping. They'd cleaned all the kids out. They'd taken them out of, out of this, this dormitory. I walked into the dormitory and the temperature dropped at least 20 degrees. Okay. And I looked and it was during the summertime. I looked at, at the orderly. I said, do you have the air on? He goes, no, we don't have air conditioning. I go, yeah, that's right. No air conditioning. Of course. I said, it's freezing in here. He goes, I know it is. He said, it's very strange. Well, I went over to Bobby and I actually saw, we, we saw Bobby levitate off the bed. I mean, actually lift off the bed. And this was not a exorcist, you know, uh, where I derived it from the exorcist. As a matter of fact, I think the exorcist came out in the seventies. It may have been out around this time, but I didn't know about the movie at this time. So I had, I wasn't relating it to that. And I go on to tell in the book about shock therapy. I used to give shock therapy and where the glands would swell up and I give it, we would ish, give it to some of these, they, they couldn't be under 18, had to be over 18, some of the patients. And I remember when I saw the movie, The Exorcist, after all of this, I said, wait a minute, this William Peter Blatty, he must have had something to do with mental health because the levitation, the swelling of the, you know, in The Exorcist, Linda Blair's throat swell, the glands. It was just very strange, Richard. Wow. Yeah. Uh now, speaking of, um, you mentioned uh, abuse. <clears throat> you had a 12-year-old cousin uh, that was tortured and murdered um, some 30 years ago. Can we, uh, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, Shonda, Shonda, uh, Shonda Cher, uh, she was my cousin. Uh, I had seen her three weeks before. She was at my wedding, a little 12-year-old, beautiful little girl, big brown eyes, never, never forget it. And, uh, I got a call uh, one morning that, um, she'd been murdered and, uh, and it's in, in my book. I, I, I researched it, investigated it. And, uh, I think the title in the book is Shonda Shear was not murdered. Well, she wasn't, she was sacrificed. Um, she was taken out by, uh, it was four other young girls, uh, under the age of 18 years old, they beat her, they set her on fire, they burned her, they took her to certain locations that were actually locations used in satanic ritual abuse. Um, and just the things that they did and the way they did it, whether they knew what they were doing, I don't know, I doubt it, but they were moved by a force bigger than you and I, a dark force on uh, sacrificing Sh Shonda. And it, like I said, it's in the book and I detail it out, but the, yeah, it was a sad event. Oh dear. Um, you know, we're told when we bring this up that this is child sacrifice and so forth. Oh, this is, uh, you're, uh, a QAnon conspiracy theorist and so forth. <clears throat> and yet I don't think a month goes by when we don't hear about a major bust from some state police service, uh, breaking up a child sex ring or some sort of a, you know, uh, human child, human trafficking ring. Um, there's never been more protective child service organizations. Uh, I, I don't think ever. And yet this seems to be almost a, a pandemic. The, uh, the amount of children that are being abducted and sexually abused and trafficked, what's going on? Well, <clears throat> probably the two most dangerous things I've ever gotten myself into um, in the world of what I do now, which is uh, investigating um, is when <laughs> is, well, let me start with the most dangerous thing. <clears throat> the most dangerous thing was human trafficking. When I went to Atlanta, Georgia and started researching the human trafficking organization there, I went to Central America. I found a country that where the human trafficking, trafficking was the, the most prevalent. And then I found out it went from there to Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia is a hub or was a hub up until several years ago. I think it probably still is. But I started asking questions and I went to different human trafficking organizations, which was, by the way, was located in one specific area of Atlanta. It was uh, East Atlanta, East Cobb, actually, East Cobb County. And I was met with ice cold showers. Um, I was met with not welcome, Matt, but 
what is it you're trying to find out? What is it you want? What is, and and I'm not saying at all, Richard, as a blanket statement that this is all every human tra anti-human trafficking organization out there. But I'm going to tell you, I encountered what I believe anti-trafficking, human trafficking organizations that were just fronts for human trafficking. Um, it was very strange. So what I'm saying is it's a big business um, and you're going to see more child protective services out there, but I don't know that they're really protecting and I don't, and, and it could be some of them uh, uh, are, you know, controlled by a, and I call it, um, I call it the, the, um, the puppeteer, which we might get into a little bit later, which goes back to this antichrist system. But they're controlled. They're controlled. They're they're told not to do certain things or to do certain things, because it's a big business, and children are bought and sold every day. And um, it's uh, a delicate um, topic, obviously. But to what extent are these human trafficking rings and child sex rings um, funneling these children into satanic uh, rituals? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> we know that in satanic rituals, we call them SRA, there's two types. There's the corporate, which is usually ran by a coven. A coven is usually a, a group of 13, um, or it could be an individual or several people. This is not corporate. They have a different agenda. But let's start with the corporate agenda, which is the covens. They do this uh, child sacrifice um, <clears throat> Uh, to 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 feed their gods, um, to to honor their gods. Okay, um, and and they it requires blood and it requires innocent blood and it requires blood of the youth. So so there's a huge demand for children uh, for this particular purpose. So you can imagine the kind of money that exchanges hands when this kind of thing happens. Now, the other type of SRA can be an individual doing it to another individual. It could be several people. This is usually done not to, not to feed their God, not to uh, do anything that uh, it has any agenda other than it was done to them, they're addicted, they're doing it uh, to, to another child. Going back to the corporate structure, which is um, the uh, covens, the other purpose they have is to create what we call program multiples, which we mentioned at the beginning of the show. This is to take and split children into multiple personalities with one personality that has a specific agenda. Okay. Now, I believe that when children are broke into program multiples, there are certain children that are programmed to go out and get involved in human trafficking to find other children. Think about it. If you can program enough kids to go out and get kids, of course, the kid grows up, right? They're an adult. Um, now you've got a whole bunch of program multiples out there recruiting other children. Wow. Fracturing their psyche. This was developed by the Nazis and a lot of these scientists were brought into the United States through Operation Paperclip and MK Ultra, of course, is an offshoot of that. Uh, you fracture their psyche and then you compartmentalize the brain through ritualistic abuse and torture and drugs. And you can turn these damaged people into uh, mules, assassins, and they may appear perfectly normal during one part of their life and then yeah, they have this secret other life that nobody knows about. They don't even know about it necessarily. Right. Yeah, that, that's true. And to be a little more specific, because I got a lot of people ask me, David, how did it get over here? You know, how did it, how, why is it so prevalent? Well, in, in, in Germany, Nazi Germany, after the war, these criminals had to go somewhere. Uh, they were shipped off, and I'm going to give you the Johnny Thunder tour uh, version. They were shipped off uh, to, through the Vatican, uh, by way of what we call the, the Red Cross passport. Uh, the, the, Red, it was, the Red Cross was a front for this. They moved them into Italy. Then they moved them down to uh, uh, South America. From South America, they brought them into the United States. 
And this, by the time they ended up in the United States, we're talking the late 40s, early 50s. A lot of them ended up at state hospitals, mental state hospitals. I talk about this in the book. Most mental hospitals that were run by the government, by the state, also had cemeteries. The, the hospital I worked at, Central State Hospital, had a huge cemetery. This cemetery had very few headstones. In other words, people would come in, they would just disappear, and they'd be buried in the cemetery. Okay. I investigated this. I researched this. I'm under the belief that there was experiments going on across the country during this time in these mental facilities um, on patients that usually probably were wards of the state. They didn't have any family. It was safe to experiment with them. That way, something happened and they were done. They got buried. Nobody's going to ask questions. <clears throat> Richard, it was all over the country. It happened at the hospital that I worked at. Now, I'm not saying they experimented on them there. I don't know what they did, but I can tell you that patients would just end up out in the cemetery with no headstones. Wow. Um, it's reported that a lot of that went on, on in um, Montauk on, on Long Island. I, um, are you familiar with the situation in Montauk? I think they called them the Lost Boys. Kids would just disappear off the street and they would end up at this uh, facility. Yeah. Well, I think that that was probably a derivative of what we're talking about. They had to somehow get them over here and get them into the system. And through this, and what better way to do it than a state hospital, right? Um, what better way to do it with patients that didn't have families? And, you know, because in mental health, it's not like, it's not like, a, 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 it's not like a, a medical hospital where you're treating someone's um, a broken leg or, uh, you know, even someone that's in there for, for cancer or whatever. It's, it's not like that. When you're dealing with mental health, back then you had such a such a great license to play with certain things you could do things you couldn't get away with in a quote you know medical facility so I, this is why i believe they they started out with the mental institutions first a new richard Serrett's strange planet drops every monday wednesday and friday subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com